life living and making a living can sometimes wear us out, grind us down, and dull our senses. So for a keen mind and a sharp contributive edge that can make it all easier and better and more productive, let's take some time to sharpen our axe. Stay with us right now for Life Talk. Excuse me just a minute. I think we better welcome some people. Hi. Uh, you've evidently either surfed to or purposely selected Life Talk. And um, every week we're on doing a selection of verbal essays about life, living, making a living, and sometimes loving. And we were visiting this evening uh, briefly here about what it was we were going to discuss this evening. And I said I was holding something back, something in abeyance, that I wanted to kind of mention. Now, I'm certain that some of you... Uh, have read this in the newspaper, possibly heard about it on television or on the radio. And although uh, it's considered somewhat inappropriate to read uh, as a speaker, I'm going to do that because I don't want you to feel that I'm misquoting or exaggerating. Uh, there's an article put out by the New York Times. It appeared in practically every newspaper in the country. Um, and it said, Plunging deeply into a Microsoft world, that promises ultra-fast, low-power computers, a research team has for the first time fashioned simple computing components no bigger than a single molecule. Now, Hewlett Packard Company and the University of California in Los Angeles say their work could be a step toward computers 100 billion times faster than today's most powerful personal computers. Can you imagine? And they envision a world in which supercomputing power is so pervasive and inexpensive that it becomes an integral part of every man-made object. Uh, this is pretty fascinating. Uh, we can potentially get the computer, computational power of 100 workstations on the size of a grain of sand. Now that's going to come up again this evening. Uh, James Heath, a UCLA chemistry professor uh, who led the research team, said, I'm hopeful we can do it in about a decade. And in all probability, you know how things are going, it'll probably happen even faster. Uh, but the researchers have found a way to build circuits using chemical processes rather than light. Now, I'm going to skip over here. Ultimately, it could create a new class of fantastic voyage-style machines. Do you remember the movie where, I believe it was Raquel Welch and some other characters, uh, were sailing throughout the body, and uh, it was a pretty good m movie, but at any rate, uh, their sensors traveling within a person's bloodstream, issuing alerts if health problems are encountered. Uh, pretty fascinating. Now, this is the closest thing I've seen to a molecular computer. Computer memory makers are now beginning to produce chips that can store one billion bits of data on a single chip. That's 16 times the capacity now common in personal computers. But such feats pale in comparison to the promise of a molecular scale computer. To illustrate the density possible at the molecular level, uh, you can imagine a mouthful of water contain so many molecules that if they were each uh, represented by a sheet of paper, uh, they would form a stack of paper that would reach from the earth to the sun 400 million times. 400 million times. A singular molecular computer could conceivably have more transistors than all the transistors and all the computers in the world today. My goodness, isn't that exciting? Uh, you know, I look back, uh, I'm still fascinated by the telephone. <laughs> and I'm just beginning to get a little adept at the computer and enjoying the use of email and being able to surf the web and find things. Uh, and then I look at this and I say, what in the world is happening? And it's all good. I'm optimistic. But I'm also conscious, and it came up in a couple of conversations that we had today, I'm also conscious of the fact that in spite of that, the most magnificent computer of them all, the most precious possession that we have while we're here on this planet, our mind, okay, is still going to fall short of doing what it's capable of doing 
on a socioeconomic level. In other words, it seems like with all the computer power we've got, life isn't getting any easier. Not a single day goes by as I go out and visit with people and put on presentations and seminars and what have you, where I don't encounter people who, in the beginning, when you encounter that person, the aura that surrounds them, you know, the essence of them, that socioeconomic uh, veneer that they present, they really look like they've got their act together. Uh, Healthy-minded, progressive people doing fine. But then as you listen, and usually you do have to listen, you begin to find the pain, the upset, the aggravation, the bereavement, the, the wonder, the doubt, the confusion, and the quiet desperation that exists out here. It's incredible. Um, now some of this is a little bit of a review for some, new for others. Uh, but I do want to talk about this computer that we're talking about. Um, it's encased inside the cranium. Now I don't pretend to be an artist, but let's do a profile here. Not too bad. And let's talk about this mass of tissue. Uh, about uh, 48 ounces, three pounds of membranous tissue that if you could peel it apart, and you could since it's membranous, and kind of stick those pieces all together, it would cover Arco Arena. A huge mass of, of tissue that represents uh, at the present time 115 billion brain cells. 115, that's with a B, billion brain cells. Now that's quite an advance over what we used to be aware of uh, when the computers were st first coming out. I believe it was back in the late 50s. I remember they had these card computers in the military and I mean they were huge machines and they would sort and file and what have you in a very exciting way. Sure cut down the workload a lot uh, and that's what they were working with. At that time I remember hearing that someday the computer will match the human mind. Uh, but with the computer power that was available, that computer, they estimated, would have to be as tall and as big as the Empire State Building. And we used to say, whoa, that's some big computer, you know. Well, recently, as a doctor, uh, or actually a neurophilosopher surgeon in San Diego, California, who wrote a book about the brain. And she, she made reference to that. And with the current computer technology, that's today's computer technology, she was saying, well, they were right in those days. Uh, that computer, in order to match the potential of the brain, would have to be indeed as tall as the Empire State Building. However, it would probably have to be about the size of Texas. This would today's technology. This thing is so magnificent, and we take it for granted. And I'm going to appeal to you this evening to start reperceiving what's inside here. Not just yours, but what you're encountering all day long. The brain, the mind power. Because um, I'll tell you, if you become mind conscious, uh, there's going to be less non-people in your life. I mean, you're going to encounter people with a certain, wow, look at that potential. Um, 115 brain cell, billion brain cells is pretty fascinating. Something I read not too long ago, I found kind of fascinating, that nearly 70%, up to as high as 90% in some things, of the nutrition that you take into the body actually goes to provide for the brain, and that the rest of it is for the rest of the body. That's kind of a disproportionate thing, um, and yet uh, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, there's another reality that the brain cells themselves really... Uh, they're quite a gift, but they don't mean much unless they're inspired, stimulated. Uh, what's really happening is that you have all these brain cells inside the cranium, and unless they're impacted in some way, in some sensory way, why they just they just nestle there and wait, and perhaps go underdeveloped. However, every time we see or hear or feel or smell or taste, encounter a new word, uh, a new vision, a new idea or a concept, something happens inside there where this cell or cells send out little dendrites. Okay, and you hear something else and there's a little dendrite and you hear something else and there's a dendrite. And pretty soon, one day, those dendrites encounter one another. And at that point, there's a flash 
<laughs> it's like a magnificent light that occurs, and all of a sudden you have a synapse. S Y N A P S, a synapse. And a synapse essentially is a point of understanding, an, an awareness, knowledge, or a skill perhaps. Now, the reason I get excited about the computer here, uh, they've done some work on this, and they're contending that the number of synapses, potential synapses in your mind, in your brain, uh, if it was stimulated, if it reached out, if it was alert and curious, alive and aware, those synapses would be equal to the number of droplets of water coupled with all the grains of sand on the planet. An unimaginable figure. Can you imagine? Now, all the droplets of water that exist in all the oceans and seas and rivers and lakes and brooks and ponds, okay, and, and, and clouds, and then coupled with all the grains of sand that exist on all the mountains and the deserts and the valleys and the ocean floors, individual grains of sand all combined into one number, the number of synapses in your mind. That is something to get excited about. Uh, there's a physicist in England who has put a numerical uh, figure to this. And what he's done over the years, he's worked at it for some time, I gather, that he has determined that a 12-point letter, a num numer, a, num uh, a number, 12 points, you know what that is on a computer, <clears throat> the number of synapses would represent Let's see here. Let's do one more. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Actually, I'm being silly. The, the estimated figure would run out six and a half million miles. Six and a half million miles. Uh, this is something to get excited about. However, something is holding us back. You know, like we hear that we thought you were using about 10% of our brain power. Not at all true. They're beginning to realize that it's like one fraction of 1%, perhaps, at this point in our development. Um, that uh, there's a long way to go. <clears throat> and when you figure, with all this capacity, what is happening or what is not happening. For example, we've been existing together as a cognitive community for 6,000 years plus. Uh, it may be a great deal longer, but it's beginning to measure out so far as about 6,500 years. And yet, we're still not very good at it. And there's too many wars, too many people posturing and positioning themselves in an adversarial way, uh, too many divorces, certainly, um, too much bereavement, um, too much sadness, uh, too much frustration, too much anger, too much pain, too much wonders, too much doubt. Uh, what is going on? Well, what we've done essentially is put an incredible amount of emphasis on the protoplasm that carries this around. In other words, this is what's important, but we've put our importance on this. You know how we do, uh, tall, short, fat, thin, uh, pretty, homely. Oh, and then of course, there's, we separate by man, woman. Ever since I can remember, they've been trying to separate us and, and attach gender issues to characteristics, and they try to at attach them to individuals, and it's not necessarily true. I see opposites and uh, contrary things constantly. Uh, it's really not fair what they do. Oh, and then of course, and of course, we have the whites, and we have the blacks, and we have yellow people, and we have brown people, and that separates us even more. And then if that didn't handle it, why, we'd find some other way, blue eyes and brown eyes, uh, brunettes and blondes. Uh, and we see it and we, we, we hear it all the time. And what we have to do is to become conscious, truly conscious of the fact that what it's about is up here, we're all essentially the same. Um, this protoplasm that we make our judgments about is essentially limited to three primary functions. Okay? One is perambulation, to perambulate, to propagate, and to perpetuate. Now, what I mean by that is um, this protoplasm has been beautifully designed. I mean, 
hundreds, possibly millions of miles of nerve and tissue and fiber and tendon and muscle and bone. Okay, and all these things combined uh, designed to help us perambulate. The brain. Okay, the idea of the body is to get the brain so we can do this. Kind of turn around, okay, peek behind perhaps this easel, go through that door. It may be another door out there and eventually across the horizon. Okay? In other words, this is what this is designed to do, perambulate the brain. And anything that does it better than this body, okay, was created by the what? Exactly, by the brain. In other words, it was the mind that perceived the sail and the wheel. Okay? And eventually, of course, the rocket. And eventually, there's no little question, new ways of propulsion that will overcome our inability to reach the furthest planets. Uh, we have the capacities. We should be excited about them. Uh, propagate. There's something about the brain that wants new brains. Uh, and we're going to talk about that primal force that exists in the brain that is, I mean, fundamentally designed to perpetuate itself through propagation. In other words, uh, it's a powerful force. Uh, now, when we examine it, it's an ignorant, indolent force. Okay, and that was, it's a subconscious part of the brain that demands this propagation. And so it doesn't make judgments about the social mores, as it doesn't care if people are married or single, doesn't care if they're rich or poor. In other words, it just wants new brains. And as a result, you can imagine some of the anguish and the pain that results from that. I mean, kids having children prematurely, not able to care for them, uh, essentially impacting their whole lives because they have responded, okay, to a subliminal part of the brain that doesn't care, doesn't care a bit. Um, or um, people having children that can't afford them. I mean, all over the world. In fact, the poorer the people are, the more children they tend to have because they die. And so in order to propagate, they have to keep producing children in order to, to save, to have one out of three, one out of four, one out of five. Uh, <clears throat> we're getting good at this. Uh, it's just that, like in perambulating, we've gotten good at it. And at propagating, we get better and better and better. For example, women are having babies today that couldn't have had them a decade ago through all kinds of research and development. Uh, but then it goes beyond that. Just the other day, I was reading in another newspaper um, about in Japan how they, uh, they had a nanny goat, no, it was a mother goat, who had, uh, had two uh, calves. And from the mother's milk, they produced three more through cloning processes. In other words, they didn't even need a male. Didn't even, you guys better be careful. You guys better be here. Uh, I understand that some research has been done that we, they can actually impregnate two female, female eggs and create a female. We get better and better at this. Um, at, a time, at a time when we really should be concerned about perpetuating our environment. In other words, there's a mass population that's impinging upon the environment. And so, but yet, uh, we're good at this too, perpetuate. In other words, to protect and preserve the environment so we can continue to exist. That's what the role of the body is for, okay? Now, how come we're not better at this? Well, we can blame it on this little rascal right at the base of the brain. Um, it's called a thalamus, a thalamus. It's about the size of your pinky. In other words, if you held your pinky up, that's about the size of your thalamus at the very uh, base of the brain, on the brain stem. Thalamus, thalamus, T-H-A-L-A-M-U-S. Now, when they go in there and they dissect it and determine the fibrous content and the electrochemicals that flow through it, the magnetism and the size and what have you, they find that it's identical, identical to the brain of a cat, felineal, felineal brain. Okay. Now, this manifests itself societally. The fact that part of our brain is felineal produces the kind of behavior that we read in the paper occasionally. For example, some of us don't realize that tabby cats, all cats, tigers and lions, and your little pussycat at home has a natural propensity, uh, and that is for a male cat to, other, to kill other male kitties. In other words, it's just what they do. And so that felineal part of a brain 
seems to activate itself sometimes when the boyfriend will abuse or even kill his girlfriend's child of another man. It's fairly common out here, and it goes both ways. I mean, a woman can be essentially the same way, too, if we're not careful. Uh, and there's all kinds of examples that we could give for that. Now, you go below that, okay, in this computer, and you have another factor here called the hypothalamus. We're going to stick that over here, hypothalamus. And when we examine that, it's identical to the brain of a reptile. It's a reptilian brain. Some time ago, I read a book that was called The Dinosaur Brain, and they were talking about the impact that the hypothalamus has on our behaviors. Now, we have to remember one... Oh, let's, let's expand this a little bit um, <clears throat> so that we're not too far off track here. Reptilian. It's kind of uncomfortable to think about it, but imagine, if you would, a little cocoon about the size of a kidney bean deep in your brain that has within it a coiled viper. And its function is survival. It's a survival mechanism. Okay? So let's take a look at that. Let's say you're walking uh, oh, through a desert or in a park somewhere, and you happen upon a rattlesnake. You startle it, didn't hear you coming, and there you are. What is it likely to do? Exactly. As it coils and it'll strike and sink its fangs into your flesh and you may die, or wish you could. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, in other words, it lashes out in order to survive and it fights. And you know what's really funny? We don't indict the snake. We don't say, naughty, naughty snake. You know what I mean? Yeah, we just know that's what snakes do, so we steer clear of them. Now, some people who don't know any better will kill the snake. What I mean, don't know any better? The snake renders a service to our community. I mean, uh, along your riverbanks and what have you, without snakes, you'd have rats and vermin, all kinds of vermin. So they have a job to do. So they say, stay, stay clear, respect the snake. No, that's what it's likely to do. However, on some other occasion, uh, you walk along and that very same snake may flee. Now, rather than striking out, it slithers off into the underbrush and leaves you alone. Uh, they call this the fight-flee response. I, I, uh, I take that to task. I think it's the fight-flee reaction because that's its nature. It's a reactive survival entity. That same snake on another day may surprise us just by freezing up. We used to call it playing possum when I was a kid because possum is really good at that. I mean, when they play dead, you just think they're dead. Uh, what is this about? Well, it's part of that snake's instinct that knows that a predator doesn't want the dead snake. As if that happened to be an eagle or a cougar, well, it'll nip at it and paw at it and try to get it to move. And if it does, well, that's, it's over for the snake. But if the snake continues to play dead, why, well, eventually it'll abandon it because it doesn't want the dead snake. It wants to kill. Now, of course, if that happened to be a vulture, well, the snake made a mistake. And it's going to have to fight back in some way. <clears throat> you and I do essentially the same thing. And we're not going to delve too deeply into it tonight, but know this. We do our fighting and fleeing and freezing verbally, kinetically, and physically. Because we all know what it's like to fight verbally. We do a lot of damage with a spoken word. And a lot of damage may have been done. Actually, oddly enough, it's a spoken word and the unspoken word sometimes. Um, and then, of course, uh, we can do it kinetically. Body movements, the shrugging of a shoulder, the turning of a head, the rolling of an eye, a sneer, a snicker. Sure, uh, we can do a lot of damage that way. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we can freeze up. Um, and we do that kinetically, and, you know, verbally, kinetically, and physically. And what that means is freezing up is not communicating. No, it's being mo moody, and you know how dangerous that can be. <clears throat> also, all of this causes us to make judgments about anything that's different. That's a subliminal activity. And not until we become conscious and educate, elevate, enhance our conscience, can we really, really begin to live together as a community and be able to synergize and capitalize on this incredible, incredible computer that we're all carrying around. How dare we take that for granted? You know, the truth of the matter is, I look back over my lifetime and I can't remember a single time at our d dinner table, can't remember hanging out with the boys in the locker room after a football game or at the bank wall in the evening waiting for something to do. Or um, 
I can't remember in school, any of the classes, in grade school and secondary, high school, secondary, you know, in advanced training, where we ever sat around celebrating the brain, celebrating the fact that we have this incredible tool up here. We just kind of take it for granted because we all have one. And I'm saying, uh, let's stop that. Just stop it. Uh, acknowledge and celebrate what you've got. And I tell you, I heard something the other day that makes a lot of sense. Begin to make a hobby of the mind. Make a hobby of the mind. Play with it. Examine it. Study it. Test it. Uh, see what you can do with it. Uh, and certainly don't take it for granted uh, because it can be a lot of fun. Ways to enhance it, of course, is uh, have experiences. You've had one this evening, and we're going to have another one next week. I uh, appreciate your kind of slowing down and tuning in, dropping by. Uh, and I can only say that I would hope that you go out and make it a good day for someone. Yes, make it a good day for someone, because that way two people would have had a nice day. Two lives would have been enhanced, enriched, and enlivened. But thanks a lot, and we'll look forward to visiting next time.